Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. How's everybody? Good. Thank you for that thunderous response. (laughs) Hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here. We're going to continue our series in Philippians today, where we're calling this the Summer of Joy. Philippians is called the Book of Joy, which is totally ironic because uh, it was written from a prison cell. Paul wrote the book from a prison cell, and he talks about how we can have joy in any situation. So really quick, self-serving thing here. My new book, Keep It Light, is available in the back. I brought a few copies of it as a book about how to find balance. So many people I talk to, they're struggling with how to find a balance between work and home and job and, and ministry. And this is a book about how just really practical steps you can take to really receive what Jesus says when he says, my burden is light. How do you walk that out? So that's available in the back. Uh, Also, if you have read the book, I've heard a lot of people saying they actually got through the book because it's a quick, short read. Would you mind leaving a review of it on wherever you got the book from, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Target? That really helps me out. And um, just make sure it's an honest five-star review, okay? (laughs) No honest three-star reviews, all right? If if you're going to leave a three-star review, just come talk to me personally, all right? So that's available in the back. All right, we're going to start. I want to do something a little bit different. I want everybody, if you would, close your eyes for a second, Okay? And I can see if your eyes aren't closed, so you better keep them closed. All right. And I want you to think about something. What's the best thing about you? Now, listen, a lot of people give them their spiritual answers. Jesus, Jesus in me. Okay, yeah, that's good. We know that. What's the best thing about you? What is it that you bring to the table that you're like, yeah, I'm really pretty good at this? You got it? I'll give you a second more. All right. Next question. What's the worst thing about you? Mm -hmm. All right, you can open your eyes. So I'm guessing you had a way easier time coming up with the worst thing about you, right? Than you did the the best thing about you. Anybody relate to that? You don't have to raise your hand. Yeah. We can all kind of spot our flaws. And some of us, we grew up only hearing about the worst things from us. Some of us, we grew up in, in, in religious backgrounds where you were just, it was all guilt and condemnation. You're like, I'm just a bug, right? You know, listen. And listen, apart from Jesus, we are just a bug. <laughs> but with Jesus, when he comes in, he saves us, man. He sets us on the path to becoming all he made us to be. So here, here's the interesting, fascinating thing about this. Um, I asked my wife, I said, what's, what do you think is the best thing about me? Because sometimes you can't see the best thing about you because you're just too close to yourself. And I asked her what the best thing about me was, and she, what she said kind of surprised me. I didn't, it was kind of, I didn't expect it. She said, that, she said, I'm a really good listener. And I was like, what'd you say? <laughs> just kidding. I didn't do that. But she said, I'm a really good listener. But I was like, okay, that's cool. But it kind of fits in what I actually thought was the best thing about me. And here's the thing that's the best thing about me. I have this ability to just see big picture really quick, make snap judgments about what's going on and what needs, what's going to be a problem and what needs to be fixed. So another part of what I do is I do leadership consulting. I consult with executives. I help them kind of change business models, face challenges they're facing in their business. And I just have this gift. And for a long time, I thought everybody saw it. And I'm like, why are people paying me to help point out their problems? A lot of people, it's just so natural to me. I can see it. And it's a weird, weird thing. So I, we were at a party one time and I looked at this couple and they were standing across the room from each other. And they looked at each other for a second and then looked away. And I was like, they're in a major like marital problem. Like they're probably going to get a divorce. And I told my wife that, and she's like, what? They just went on vacation together? No. And sure enough, a couple weeks later, she texts him, I'm done. Marriage is over. She was like, how'd you see that? I'm like, I don't know. I can just see this stuff, right? And some of you guys are afraid to look me in the eye now because I'm like. (laughs) But I have this ability. I can just kind of look at stuff, size it up real quickly, and I'm like, that's going to be a problem. I can see when there's a plan that's not going to work. One of the things that drives my wife crazy is when I tell her there's a hole in that plan. She's like, stop saying that. Why you got to be a downer about everything? Just go with it. Just go with the plan, with all the holes. The boat will sink, but it's fine. We can swim, right? So (laughs) as you can tell, my wife and I are opposites. So uh, that's the good thing about me, right? But here's the bad thing about me. Because I see problems everywhere, I see problems that don't even exist yet. And I live with a constant state of anxiety, because I'm constantly worried about the things that are going to go wrong. So for example, we have this retreat center that we give, uh, we give away time to pastors and missionaries. And the way we fund it is we rent out the properties on Airbnb. 
And we have people that'll write in questions and stuff. And if they ask too many questions, I'm like, Emily, reject them. Don't let them book our place. She's like, why? And she's they're just asking questions. I'm like, they're problem people. They're going to be a problem. We don't want them around. <laughs> she's like, they're just asking questions. I'm like, no, nope, no, nope, no Airbnb for you, right? No. Nope. <laughs> That's what I just, I, if you're going to be a problem to me, I ain't going to, no, I see the problem coming, right? So, that, but that's my problem is I oftentimes see things that really aren't a problem. Some of the coolest people we've ever had, I would have probably rejected them on Airbnb if it weren't for my wife. They come in like, wow, these are super cool people. They were just asking what kind of coffee we had, you know? So <laughs> that's my problem, okay? So here's what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced that your greatest, the best thing about you is directly connected to the worst thing about you. It just depends on how it's used. So here's an example. Okay, some of you, man, you are like super detail exacting people. You do it right and you pride yourself on, I do it right. I do it right. And some of you, man, you're engineers and we thank God you do it right every time we drive over that bridge. You are exacting people. But the negative side of that is you're a perfectionist. And you won't do anything if you can't do it perfect the first time. So consequently, you get stuck. And you won't take a step because you're, well, if I can't get it right the first time. And listen, anything worth doing is worth doing badly at first. Because you got to learn how to do it. But you're stuck because you're a perfectionist. And you're like, well, if I can't do it perfect, well, maybe you're afraid of being embarrassed because you always do things perfect and not do something perfect. You'd be like, oh, that's not me, right? But you get stuck because of that negative thing. Some of you, your greatest, the best thing about you is you can see people's needs and you meet them. You're very caring. You go, man, I see needs before anybody else sees it and I meet that need, right? That's the great thing about you. But here's the negative thing about it. You're constantly caring for other people so much that you neglect your own needs, and you're suffering and you're hurting. And here's the thing. The worst part about it is you're getting bitter and resentful because you're always there for everybody else. But they're never there for you. Anybody relate to that? And so the worst thing about you is you carry around this kind of general resentment about how nobody's ever there for you. But you're there for everybody else. Anybody relate to that? Yeah. The best thing is often connected to the worst thing. I, t I read a book the other day that was saying some of the best business leaders were former drug dealers. They have a natural mind for business, but they just use it in a negative way, right? So I want to talk about that this morning, about how this idea that the best is usually connected to the worst. And I want to point out something really quick. If the thing that came to your mind when you thought the best thing about you was, I'm really good looking, <laughs> or something to that effect, I'm wondering if maybe you've been evaluating your life based on the wrong thing, because if the best thing about you isn't something you can use to bless others, it's probably not actually the best thing about you. So here's my point this morning. If you don't walk away with anything else, I even made it rhyme so it's easy to memorize. When the best of me is not for me, I'm on the path to true glory. Let's say I'll say it together. You ready? One, two, three. When the best of me is not for me, I'm on the path to true glory. And here's what I mean by this. When you're using the thing that's the best of you, not for advancing your own purposes, but you're using it to bless others, that's when you're on the path to something really good coming from it. So we're going to talk about that this morning. We've been looking at this letter that Paul wrote to the people of Philippi. He wrote this letter, and we talked two weeks ago how Paul says, look, people are the point. The most important thing you can focus on is people because we show God how much we love him by how much we love people. But the problem is some people aren't very lovable and it's really hard to love people. So that's where the trench warfare comes in. We're like, I love God, but I hate people. You can't do that. You got to love God. And the way you show you love God is by loving people. People are the point. And we talked last week about the fact that people are also the cause of most of the pain in our lives. And so you have to learn how to deal with conflict. If I would encourage you to go back and listen to this. And one of the best compliments I heard this week is a guy came up to me. He said, you know, this series has got me reading through Philippians on, on my own. And I'm like, sweet, we've accomplished our purpose. Because the goal here is for you to go and read through Philippians on your own and get God to give you insight. Because we're going to look at a passage today. And I'm going to tell you this. This passage we're going to look at today it literally could be an entire summer. We could look at this passage the entire summer because there's so much depth in it. And every passage of scripture, everything that God has written has infinite layers of truth to it because truth is really big. I mean, I've been hanging out in the church for 46 years, been reading the Bible for 40 something of it. And I'm still finding every time I open the Bible, I'm like, did not even see that was in there. 
and I know a lot of the Bible, but I'm still perpetually blown away by it. And the goal here is for you to get in the Word because the Holy Spirit's going to show you things about your unique life situation that you need to hear, and He's going to reveal that to you as you read through the Scripture. Don't take my word for it. Like, always go check it against the Scripture. Don't just trust me. Always check it against the Scripture. And today's passage is one of those passages that I'm going to look at one angle of it. But don't you dare think that now you understand what Paul's saying here, because what he says has infinite layers of depth to it. But I want to pick up on one angle today, and this is this this angle that the gift that God has given you, the thing he placed in you, the best thing about you, is for the purpose of bringing him glory and bringing you a sense of fulfillment, right? So Paul picks up and he says this, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. He's saying all this stuff we believe about Jesus and his sacrifice and stuff, this is, the the goal should be that we come to this, this mindset together, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And this is what he says. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. Humility. Is that, that's not a word we hear much, is it? Can you imagine, like, I mean, what if we had like a whole month dedicated to humility? Wouldn't that be crazy? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And this, is, this is pretty powerful here. The Bible is really, really practical. He's saying, look, the reality is you need to care for others. But you can't care for others if you aren't caring for yourself and keeping yourself strong and healthy. Me as a pastor, I've told you this before, I'm way more concerned about my spiritual growth than yours. (laughs) Because I can't lead you, I can't share truths with you if I'm not working on my own spiritual growth. So I'm way concerned about my spiritual growth more so, so for the purpose of serving you guys with that. And the same should be true in your situation. If you're not treating yourself like somebody you're responsible for caring for, you're off track. You got to look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. But that's the key. Some of us are so self-focused that we're miserable because we're just looking to our own interests. That's the balance we have to find. So he says, have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is a pretty powerful statement. The best thing about Jesus was he was God in the flesh. He really was. But he didn't use that being God. You notice he humbled himself. That's what he says here. He says, but he emptied himself. He didn't use that I'm God for his own purposes. He says, by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to the worst possible kind of death. Painful, slow, agonizing, embarrassing, humiliating death on a cross. But that's not where it ended. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, there's a powerful principle in here, and this is the principle. God has placed something in you. He's placed a unique and special gift in you. There's a verse in Romans that says the gifts and the calling, I think it's in Romans, it says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. There are some things, some gifts, some natural abilities God placed in you that you don't even see maybe because you're too close to them, but he's never gonna take them back. And this is how some people, they're just so gifted at like making money, but they use it for their own good and own purposes and they end up miserable. And some of you can relate to that. Some of you guys here, you're just thinking, man, if I can just get one more thing, a little bit more money, I'll feel good. But you got everything you wanted and you still feel like there's this sucking vortex in you saying, no, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more. And it's probably because you've been using that thing that God gave you for the wrong purposes. But the call doesn't go away. He, left, he put that call in you and he wants you to use it. And that call is there. And you, some, some of you, man, you just feel it. And you're like, man, if I don't do this, I feel like it's almost sinning that I don't do it. I feel that way about writing. I always vow I'm never going to write another book and then I can't do it. I sit down and write a book. But it's like when I'm not writing, I feel like I'm missing out on what God called me to do. And you've got something in you that's like that. Now, you may not see it, right? My wife, she has a tremendous gift for hospitality, 
She's really good at hospitality. When you meet my wife, you're just going to feel like you're the most loved person in the world, right? Now, don't everybody come up to her afterwards looking for love, okay? But she's going to, she's just so good at it. Like, she just makes people feel welcome. I don't. I don't know. I, when I try and make people feel welcome, apparently I scare them. I just, literally, I'll come up to people like, hey, welcome. And they're like, sorry. I don't know what it is. Great gift of hospitality she has. And she does, she's so good at it. She thinks everybody's good at it, but they're not. She's so close to it. And some of you, the same thing. You have that gift within you. You're so close to it, you don't even see it. And you're, you're going to have to maybe trust others to call it out of you and say what's in there. Because maybe some of you have been so beat down, all you told was you were bad, bad, bad. And sometimes that gift gets hidden in us because we've been using that gift in the past for negative, bad things. Or maybe you were just so beat down, you just not thought there's nothing good in you. Well, well, Paul addresses this in Ephesians when he says this. He says, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. This isn't anything you did. It's not, a gift, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. This Greek word workmanship is poema. It literally means masterpiece. You are like God has been working on you to make, create this beautiful masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God placed a very unique, specific gifting and calling in you that he wants you to use. And the challenge a lot of us face is we, we spend so much time focused on the guilt and the shame of when we were using our gifts for the wrong thing or when we were using it for self-serving, or when we made all those mistakes from the past. But let me tell you this. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The apostle Paul said that in Romans. If you're feeling any condemnation after you've accepted the gift of Christ on the cross, that's not God doing that. That's not from God. If you're feeling guilt, if you're feeling shame, listen, the guilt and the shame, they drive us to the cross and we go, whoa, man, I am in desperate need of God. But the moment you accept him, Paul talks about this. We talked about this the first week of Philippians. Paul says, the moment you accept him, you're a saint. And you, you don't do good works to become a saint. You're already a saint. The moment you accepted the gift of Christ, Jesus looks at you and he says, you're completely perfect because of Jesus's work. And now you do good works because you're already a saint, which is a whole nother paradigm, a different way of looking at it. And the beautiful thing about this is now, the goal is to take the focus off of our past shame, our past guilt, our past failures, and go, I've got something in me, and I can't be bogged down anymore by what I used to be. I've got to fulfill the purpose that God placed in me. And that's what Paul, he talks about this. There's this verse uh, I love this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says this, guys, I'm the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, th think about that. You think you've got a bad track record? Paul, before he was a Christian and became an apostle, he actually was in charge of getting Christians killed for their faith. That would be some baggage that would hang on with you for a while, wouldn't it? But Paul says, in spite of that, I'm an apostle. And what's fascinating about the apostles, the apostles were considered to be those 12 guys that hung out with Jesus. Paul never hung out with Jesus in the flesh. There were some probably some apparitions of Jesus and some encounters he had with Jesus, but it was not in Jesus's earthly body. Paul was not one of the 12 disciples. But yet he says, but in spite of that, I'm still called to be an apostle, one of the fathers of the church. And what's really cool about it is he's like, I don't deserve to be, but I'm not going to focus on that. And here's what he says. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Yeah, I got some junk in my past, but there's a gift that God placed in me. And Paul had a very specific gift. He was highly trained in the law. He understood the law so he could really explain why we are no longer under the law because of Jesus. He also was a Roman citizen, which was a rare thing for Jews to be. So he was able to go travel freely among the Roman kingdom, right, empire. And he says, and his grace to me was not without effect. He said, man, when he came in, he changed everything. And so I'm going to leverage everything he's given me, not for me, but for him and to bless the people around me. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. God has placed something very specific in you. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging, I'm pretty good at this, because it was God who gave it to you, which I think is a picture of what real humility is. A few years ago, um, I started working out really hard, trying to get buff. 
and because I'm kind of a skinny guy. And uh, I remember going to the gym, and after just two or three times at the gym, I was standing there lifting the barbells, and I'm like, man, I am getting really pumped here. Like, I'm looking good. And I remember going home, and this mirror greeted me at home, and I was like, what happened? I shrunk between the gym and my house. So I started doing some research, and I realized that the gym had this mirror right by the, the barbells, the dumbbells, that slightly magnified you. So your muscles looked a little bigger than they were. And if you went to the women's section, you know what the others did? They shrunk you a little bit, right? So, so you keep coming back because you're like, man, this is working good until you get home and actually get a real picture of what you are. And you're like, oh, man. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Humility is like that reflection in the mirror. It's just having an accurate picture of you and who you are and what you bring to the table. Like Paul said, man, I got some baggage in the past. I've done some bad stuff, but I also know he's gifted me. And so I'm not going to focus on that baggage in the past stuff. I'm going to focus on using my gift to serve others because I'm at my best. The best of me is when I'm using me to bring service and, and to others. And that's when I'm on the track to glory, which is where, where, where Peter says this. He says, listen, guys, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you. What a heavy word. He may lift you up, as other versions says. And then I love this part here. He says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Is it possible that our greatest anxiety comes because we're just too focused on ourselves and getting our needs met and using the gift God gave us for our own purposes when really the way the anxiety is going to flee is when we're using our gift to help others as we're humbling ourselves and saying, I've got this gift in me that I've got to use, but I've got to use it to make sure it's not for me. It's for everyone around me. And when you do that, God gets the glory. And the cool part is you get fulfillment and you get to share in that glory. We've all met people who you look and you go, man, they have all these resources, all these things available to them. And yet they chose to do this amazing thing with it. They could have used it for their own purposes, but they used it to serve others. That's the glory I'm talking about. When you see people like that, you're like, I want that is where Jesus says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When you choose to use the gift that God placed inside of you for something that's focused on serving those around you, and you know you're on the right track, and that's where you're going to find fulfillment. And that's what humility is. It's recognizing you've got something really special in you, but that special thing, it's not for you. It's to serve those around you and to bring glory to God with it. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you have placed gifts in us and you expect us to do something with it. I thank you, Lord, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. No matter what we've done with it in the past, today is the day we can turn and begin to use those things you've given us for your purposes and to serve those around us. If you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Jesus, that is step number one to getting your life on the right track. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second here. If you say this prayer, you mean it with your whole heart. God is going to come and forgive you of your sins. He's going to forgive you of you doing it your way. And he's going to set you on the path to serving him in eternity with him. Let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Write it down. Special day today, Father's Day 2024. We've got some resources in the back to help you on your journey. And uh, I pray you guys have a blessed week. You are dismissed. Have a good one. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>